Some people think the prayer of faith, some people think the prayer of faith is crawling out on a limb and then begging God to keep someone from sawing it off. Ray Stedman continues and he says, but that's not real prayer. That's presumption. If God makes it clear that he wants you out on a limb, fine. You'll be perfectly safe there. But if not, it is presumptuous to crawl out on that limb expecting God to keep you there. What is the difference between presumption and boldness? How can we discern the difference? Evangelist John Wayne Brown Jr., by the age of 34, was known throughout the southeastern uh, Appalachia as having handled snakes since he was 17 years old. He was also known for having survived 22 previous snake bites. Well, on the night of October 3rd, 1998, the snake handling evangelist was bitten by one of his own timber rattlesnakes in the middle of his sermon. And though Reverend Brown continued to speak to the people of Rock House Holiness Church, he soon collapsed on stage. The congregation gathered around him, praying and trying to cool him off with an electric fan, but Brown was dead within minutes. Reverend Brown left behind him five orphaned children because his wife, Melinda, died of a snake bite during a revival service three years earlier. One pastor who was on stage with Reverend Brown the night of his death said he didn't think the tragedy would phase the church membership and asserted that the church would not change its practices. He said, I think they'll be more careful about handling servants. I think they'll wait until the Lord moves on them. That might be a good idea. He then added, you know, a lot of people don't understand us. We're just normal people, but we believe God's word. Boldness. Presumption. We come to a portion of Scripture today in our study in the book of Joshua in which we see the man Joshua offering up a prayer. It's a big prayer. It's a mighty prayer. He prays, sun, stand still, moon, stop. I mean, if there was a list of the top unbelievable prayers in the Bible, in my opinion, this would be on the top of the list. So look with me in your Bibles at Joshua chapter 10. Joshua chapter 10, the Old Testament book. Joshua chapter 10. And if you've been with us throughout our time in the book of Joshua, you know that under the main theme of be strong and courageous, which is our theme verse as a church, be strong and courageous. Well, under that theme, that broad theme, I have presented one focus point each week around a B statement. Things like be faithful, be unified, be diligent, be hopeful. Last week, be discerning. And perhaps it's already, uh, it should already be obvious as to how, where, where I'm going with today's passage of Scripture. It urges us to be bold. Be bold. And while it might be tempting to jump right down to this audacious prayer down in verse 12 and skip the ordinary stuff and the verses that precede it, we must resist that. Because biblical boldness is not only in what we see in Joshua's prayer, but in the actions that are the feet of faith. And so the first point for us this morning for a handle is boldness starts with doing the right thing. Boldness starts with doing the right thing. Because in Joshua chapter 10, there is a make or break situation for Joshua and the leaders. They would face an enormous test of recently questionable leadership. And as we'll see, things go a little better this time than we saw last week. And if you were with us last week, Joshua and the leadership made a colossal mistake in not seeking God when the Gibeonites pretended to be from a distant land. And the Gibeonites, you remember, they laid it on thick with their packing of old and and cracked wineskins and moldy bread and worn clothes and worn out sandals because they wanted to give the impression that they traveled this long distance. And if they traveled this long distance, then the Israelites wouldn't touch them. They wouldn't eliminate them. That was their plan. That was their angle. And Joshua and the leaders... 
They fell for the Oscar-winning performance, and they were made to look like fools. And worse, there would be this constant reminder of their failure as these Gibeonites, these deceivers, lived among them. The Gibeonites, who should have been wiped out, were able to stick around because Joshua made a treaty of peace with them, and and the leadership sealed the deal with an oath that they would let them live. And this was a wrong move on their part, all because they were wise in their own eyes and did not check in with God. Now, to their credit, They returned to principle after failure, and they would not go back on their oath that they had made before God. You see, they lived by the adage that two wrongs don't make a right. And so, so, so that's what's taking place as we come to Joshua chapter 10. It's really the consequence of their foolish decision of chapter 9, making a peace treaty with those they were ordered to eliminate. And so we pick it up at verse 3 of Joshua chapter 10. Look with me at verse a three of Joshua chapter 10. Now, I had a buddy in, in Portland, whenever he'd get to hard names like this, he'd just go hard name, hard name, hard name, hard name. <laughs> now, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to really take a stab at this. But if you want to get around it, you can do that. Here's verse three. So Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, appealed to Hoham, king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jarmuth, Japhia, king of Lachish, and Debir, king of Eglon. So Adonai Zedok is saying to these other kings, come up and help me attack Gibeon because it has made peace with Joshua and the Israelites. Then verse 5 tells us that these five kings joined forces and with all their troops with them, they took up positions against Gibeon and attacked it. Now, you see, Gibeon, by the way, was, it was only about six or, or maybe ten miles north and just a little bit to the west of Jerusalem. Jerusalem did not belong to Israelites right now, by the way. And when the Gibeonites made peace with the Israelites, it opened up Jerusalem, all of that central mountain region, to Joshua and his, his army. But, do you, but I really want you to see what's going on here. The Canaanites, those kings that I just mentioned, they formed this confederacy to fight against Gibeon, who they considered traitors. And so Adonai Zedek gathered together all the confederates that he could make, and they they went to war to destroy and to punish and to inflict their vengeance upon the Gibeonites for making peace with Israel. And now, the Gibeonites, they don't stand a chance against their attackers. They're doomed. And so they they send an email to Joshua, and in essence, they say, a little help here. That's what verse 6 is all about. Modernize it a little bit. But verse 6 is, the Gibeonites then sent word to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal, and they said, do not abandon your servants. Do not abandon us. Come up to us quickly and save us. Help us, because all the Amorite kings in the hill country have joined forces against us. Now, Now, the Gibeonites shouldn't have been their problem, but they were their problem. And it looks like the Israelites are going to have to babysit these unwelcome guests. Now, do you ever wish that a certain problem or past mistake would just kind of go away? (laughs) I have. I mean, you ever wish that a certain problem or some past mistake would, would just go away? Well, I want you to think about this. You're Joshua. Word comes to you from these same people who deceived you that they needed some help or else they're going to be wiped out. Would you have ignored their plea for help? I mean, here's your chance to bury your mistake, literally. Here's an opportunity to get rid of the reminder of that embarrassing failure. Here they are, they're asking for help. If you leave them alone, they'll get wiped out and they'll never be in your face again. I mean, wouldn't it have been kind of tempting to just kind of look the other way or to to go with something like, you know, sorry, I just never got word about your needing my help. It just must have gone into oblivion somewhere. That's what we do, right? I never, oh, you texted me? I didn't see that until afterwards. Not an option for Joshua. Verse 7. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army, including all the best fighting men. Joshua upheld his duty 
to protect them. He kept his promise because here is a man of integrity. I remind you again of Psalm 15, verse 4. I quoted this verse last week. It says that a person of integrity keeps his word even when it hurts. You see, see, boldness is seen in our obedience. Boldness is not only seen in the big things we do, but in the ordinary, everyday stuff like keeping our promise. Pastor John Bazango tells of a time when his five-year-old daughter came to him and asked, Daddy, can you build me a dollhouse out in the backyard? Sure thing, honey, he said. I promise to build you a dollhouse out in the backyard. And then he just kind of went back to what he was doing. He was reading his book. A few minutes later, he, he looked out the window and he noticed that his, his daughter had her arms filled with dishes and and toys, and and dolls, making trip after trip until she had a pile of playthings in the yard. He went out to the yard and he asked her, what what are you doing? Oh, well, you promised to build me a dollhouse. I'm just getting ready for it. (laughs) He then writes this. He said, you would have thought I'd been hit by an atomic bomb. I threw aside that book and the other things I had to do, and I, and, I, and I raced to the lumber yard for supplies and quickly built that little girl her dollhouse. Why did he respond that way? Because he had given his daughter his word. She believed it and was already acting on it. Nothing could keep him from carrying out his word at that point. Listen, boldness starts with doing the right thing. We never get to Joshua's unbelievable prayer without first passing through Joshua's unqualified commitment to keeping his word. This is no small thing. Be bold and do the right thing, church, even when it hurts. Be bold and do the right thing even when an offer is presented that is is going to compromise your integrity. Because boldness needed for bigger things begins right here with bold obedience. Throughout his administration, Abraham Lincoln was a president under fire, especially during the scarring years of of the Civil War. And though he knew he would make errors of office, he resolved never to compromise his integrity. And so strong was this resolve that he once said this. He said, I desire so to conduct the affairs of this ministration that if at the end, when I come to lay down the reins of power, I have lost every other friend on earth, I shall at least have one friend left and that friend that shall be down deep inside of me. What's he talking about? A clear conscience. How important is a clear conscience? The quotable John Wooden, well-known college basketball coach, once observed, he said, there is no pillow as soft as a clear conscience. You want boldness? It starts with doing the right thing. And Joshua does the right thing, and with a clear conscience, he goes forward in confidence to face the battle. Secondly, not only does boldness start with doing the right thing, secondly, boldness needs encouragement. Boldness needs encouragement. This was a huge challenge that Joshua faced, battling five kings and their their armies. They had to feel very overwhelming for him, and from a human perspective, the odds were stacked against him. I mean, it's hard to be bold when you're fighting a battle that seems nearly impossible to win. It's hard to be bold when you can barely keep your head above water and you feel like you're sinking one more time. It's hard to be bold then. It's hard to be bold when a loved one is sick. It's hard to be bold when when you're desperately trying to keep your job and the bills just keep piling up. It's hard to be bold when your friends laugh at you or exclude you because you don't do the things they do. 
It's hard to be bold when you are just exhausted from the daily demands on your life. I mean, who can be bold under those circumstances? And you even wonder, does God even understand? He's telling me to be bold here. Does he even understand? Well, look with me at verse 8. The Lord says these beautiful words to Joshua. Do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. Now, it seems to reason that when God says these words, do not be afraid, it suggests that there's fear to speak to. And even though Joshua knew he was doing the right thing and helping the Gibeonites, and and he knew he had a clear conscience, and this doesn't mean he wasn't shaking in his boots. Couldn't help us. I thought of fear and and, and a frightful person to, to to think of Barney Fife. You know, Barney Fife, yeah. In one episode from the TV series from the 60s, the Andy Griffith Show, Andy Taylor, the sheriff of Mayberry, he's out of town. And you know what happens to Barney Fife when he's in charge. He has deputized the local mechanic who's named Gomer. <laughs> the two deputies are walking down the street one evening when they notice that someone is robbing the town's bank. And, and they hide behind a car. They're afraid and they don't know what to do. And finally... Deputy Gomer looks at Barney and he says excitedly, Shazam, we need to call the police. (laughs) In another exasperation, Barney shoots back, we are the police. (laughs) Situation looked big and scary for you right now. And God says, I want you to step in it. And you go, me? I'd rather hide behind a car. See, real boldness, get this, real boldness is for ordinary people who are afraid. It's often quoted, courage is being scared to death and saddling up anyway. And Joshua's saddling up. But God knows he could use a nice dose of encouragement. God affirms Joshua with these words of assurance that the battle is already won in the mind of God because he says, I have given them into your hand. It's a done deal. They've already been given to you. And these are words we've seen before, haven't we, in, in the book of Joshua. I mean, you're talking about your game. In chapter 1, verse 5, we saw it coming right out of the gates. We saw it in, in chapter 6, verse 2. We saw it in chapter 8, verse 1. Same words. I've given them into your hand. Done it. Now, I believe there's something instructive for us about God's words here to Joshua in verse 8. I think there are two points of application right here. First is, the first point of application is God's usual way of reassuring us is by reminding us of promises already given. God's usual way of reassuring us is by reminding us of promises already given. And you know, I say that because there's times in which we just crave this new word from God, some new truth, because we think that new truth will have greater power in our lives. If God would just give me something new here. No, no, no. The power lies in God's old truth that meets us at our present pressing need. That's how he works. Reminds us of that. There's power in that. And then we come to the second point of application, which has to do with the timing of these words. Because I I want you to notice when God's encouragement comes, it's after Joshua did the right thing back in verse 7. He took the bold step, then God gives him encouragement. Joshua's already made his decision to keep his word and march up from Gilgal and fight this battle. Then God shows up with some much needed encouragement. Well, what's the application for us? Well, God's confirmation, God's confirmation often comes after we take the step of boldness. I don't say it always is, but if you look through scripture, you can see it with Moses and some others. Often, God's confirmation comes after we take the step of boldness. And we want to reverse that. God, give me the encouragement, and then I will be bold. God says, no, 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 hang on a second. I want you to step up and be bold, and trust me that I'll give you a dose of truth to meet your current situation. So so what step 
is God asking you to take to get from where you are, maybe it's steps, to get from where you are to where he wants you to be? Are you being asked to do something extraordinary? Maybe it's something way out of your comfort zone. And you're, and you're, you're just scared to death. Or generally speaking, what is your fear right now? Are you fearful of what lies ahead for you in, in your sickness or, or what you're going to encounter when that major change takes place in your life? Or, or maybe it's fear of the unknown or, or fear of failure or fear of intimacy or fear of rejection. I, I don't know what it is. There's all kinds of fears out there. What is it for you? Well, be encouraged. God knows that boldness needs encouragement if we're going to step out and do something beyond our ability. Be bold and take that step. And you just might discover God's timely encouragement is going to come after you take that step. Whatever that is. Well, Joshua has his timely encouragement from God and he, and he, and he goes forward into battle. He knows God's with him. See, boldness starts with doing the right thing. God knows boldness needs encouragement. And thirdly, boldness, boldness means we do what we can do, trusting God with the impossible. Boldness means we do what we can do, trusting God with the impossible. God's promised presence with us in facing life battles does not mean that we have this let go and let God uh, approach to life. You can't support that. Jesus uses, uh, Joshua here uses sound strategy and an ingenious plan. Lotus verse 9. After an all-night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. See what's happening here? I mean, fighting the battles in life require that we do something. Boldness requires we take action. We do what we are capable of doing. But remember... There is a divine component to it. Don't swing it the other way. There is this divine component to it all. As Christian business leader Fred Smith put it, he said one of the great failures of the church, one of the great failures of the church is that we often try to accomplish with human systems what only God can do. But what I noticed as I read through these verses in this true story is how the writer goes back and forth from showing Joshua's part and then God's part, Joshua's part, God's part, and winning the battle. You can't miss it. I want to give you some examples. Verse 7, verse 7, Joshua's part. What does he do? He marched up with his best fighting men. Verse 8, God's part. He says, I've given them into your hand. <laughs> verse 9, Joshua's part. Joshua launches a surprise attack. Now notice verse 10, God's part. It says, the Lord threw them into confusion before Israel. Then it speaks their part, Israel pursuing them. And then this fleeing army outdistanced the army of Israel, so God does his part again, and he has some ammunition of his own, it tells us in verse 11. I love verse 11. It says, they fled before Israel on the road down from Beth Horon to Azekah. The Lord hurled large hailstones down on them from the sky. More of them died from the hailstones than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. He opens fire with this artillery from heaven, huge hailstones. And what is astounding to me about this is not the only the open fire of hailstones from above at exactly the right time, but get this that these hailstones only hit the enemy. Not one of God's people was struck by one of these hailstones. I'm <laughs> pretty precise. I say how God did that. Now, what do the hailstones teach us? Well, I don't go off on this too much, but I think it's a very basic principle here. We never succeed in battle without God's help. We never succeed in battle Without God's help, we have never won a battle on our own. Never. And if God were not constantly fighting for us in the conflicts of life, we would have been overwhelmed long ago. Sin would have already defeated us and destroyed the last trace of our character. 
God still fights for his people and part of the wonder of heaven, the best is yet to come. Yes, it is. And part of that, I believe, is that we're going to sit around and we're going to share some stories of how God has protected us and fought for us in our lifetime, things that we don't even realize right now. Because it says in verse 11 that on the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel. You see it? The Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel. Don't miss it. The Lord gave. Oh, then we come to the good stuff. Yeah. Well, time passed. I was waiting to get to this part. This is the best part of chapter 10. Look at the middle of verse 12. Joshua prays, and, and what he failed to do previously back in chapter 9 to seek God, he makes sure he seeks him here. And notice that the people hear this prayer, it says, before the witnesses, the presence of Israel. What does he pray? He prays, O sun, stand still over Gibeon, O moon, over the valley of Ashelon. What a bold prayer. Now, honestly, I would have prayed for more hailstones. I would have. And you know why? Because I would much prefer God just zap this person over there or just take that person out over there or do whatever it is he needs to do to get the job done, and I'm just going to sit back from the distance and just watch. You do it all, God. Go. That's what I'd prefer. I would have prayed for more hailstones. Joshua could have prayed for more hailstones. What did he ask for? Joshua asked for more time. Why? I think because Joshua doesn't try and get out of what he needs to do. Joshua is willing to do his part. He's not trying to get out of the battle. He asks for more time to get the task done. You see, he looks over the situation, and he realizes that he needs more daylight. His men are weary, and if darkness falls now, the enemy would escape, and the weary soldiers would have to pick it up again in the morning, and all progress might have been lost by them. So now is the time to continue in the fighting, to keep with the task and see it through to the end. Now, don't wait till tomorrow. Let's not do another day. Let's get it done now. So why not ask God for more time? Why not ask God to cause the sun to stand still? Joshua asks, what happens? Now, if your idea of God is that he's boring, think again. Look at verse 13. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped. Now, just as a side, the sun and the moon, they were deities that these people worshipped. So God to be over the sun and the moon was an in-your-face kind of statement to the, to the enemies. It's saying, it's saying, our God is bigger than your God, or God's. So the sun stood still, the moon stopped, till the nation avenged itself on its enemies, as it's written in the book of Jashar. Now, a book of, of Jashar, is, or a book of the upright, it's called, uh, it seems to be a collection of poems in praise of certain heroes serving under Yahweh God. That's what it seems to be. It's an extra biblical um, uh, book, document. But when you pray for the sun to stand still and you pray for the moon to stop and it's answered, you've got a pretty good prayer life going. You know what I'm saying? What in the world is going on here? Now, I'm not going to get into the numerous explanation of what others think might have taken place, and, and there's a lot to it, and I could spend hours on this. I'm not going to, but, but, but there are other explanations. You know, did the earth stop? And it's, these are just questions. Did the earth stop in its rotation? Did the sun and moon actually stop in their path? Was it Maybe, you know, some suggest it was an eclipse uh, to ease up on the heat. Or maybe God caused the light to be retracted, given the appearance of a lengthened day. Some even want to theorize and say that the sun didn't actually uh, stand still, but that this is simply poetic imagery that the sun seemed to stand still, that it was the way of saying that Joshua's army got twice as much done. Now listen, be careful that we do not try to explain away the spectacular. A miracle occurred. And sometimes we don't believe it the way the Bible says it. I don't know how God did it. 
But what I do know is that one day in history, God intervened on behalf of his people and prolonged the day so that Israel had enough daylight to finish the battle. How do I know that? It says it right here. The sun stopped, end of verse 13. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There's never been a day like it before or since. I mean, can God do this or not? I mean, aren't created things under his direction and in submission to the one who created them? I mean, if God created it, he can stop it and he can start it up again and he can keep it going. Not a problem for God. See, let's take the Bible for what it says. God extended the daylight for a full day over the battle area. God did it. And if you have a problem with that miracle, then you also probably have a problem with the virgin birth of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You might as well have a problem as well with God's power to change you. C.S. Lewis said this, he said, the mind which asks for a non-miraculous Christianity is a mind in in process of relapsing from Christianity into mere religion. God moves in response to one man's request and he does the miraculous. And not only am I amazed at the wonder of the miracle, But to some degree, it's also equally amazing to me is that a holy, infinite, all-wise God would bend his ear to listen to a mere human. That blows me away. The Bible is filled with people who prayed big prayers, and as a result, God moved. I don't know about you, But when I compare my prayer life to people in the Bible and to Joshua's, I feel pretty small. I do. Now, we must wrestle with this issue of presumption or boldness. When is a big prayer boldness? And when is it presumptuous? What is the difference between the evangelist handling snakes and Joshua asking for the sun to stop? Now, I'm not going to be able to completely resolve that in the time we have today, but I do want to provide you with a few practical checkpoints. A few practical checkpoints. Number one, first of all, let Scripture be your guide. Let Scripture be your guide. Always go back to the Bible. Because Joshua's request here, you need to notice this, Joshua's request was lodged in the promise of verse 10. Joshua is standing on the truth of God's word to him. I have given them into your hand. It is boldness when we operate in God's truth. It is presumption when we go beyond Scripture and claim something that was never promised to us in the first place, like one handling something as dangerous and deadly as snakes. Don't go further than Scripture. First of all, secondly, I refer to you to last week's lesson on be discerning. Be discerning. It pays to be a little suspicious. It's one thing to be a fool for Christ. It's another matter completely to just be a fool. I think we've seen too many times Christians who say, ah, I'm a fool for Christ. No, you're not. You're just a fool. And you're being foolish. And the watching world is calling it that. All right, I got to go to the third one. I could really go down that road. Thirdly, third checkpoint, our motivation is to bring God glory. Our motivation must be to bring God glory. That's a checkpoint. To think that we can negotiate with God to keep life working the way we want it to work misses the point. This has nothing to do with manipulating God for our own selfish ends. We have to ask, what is my motivation here? And and, in praying a bold prayer, or is it going to be presumption? What is my motivation? Am I doing it to manipulate people or to try and manipulate God? Or am I doing it to bring God glory? See, presumption tests God. Boldness honors God. 
So am I doing this to test God or to honor God? And when we're doing it to honor God, we can then move forward with boldness. Here's a question. How important, don't answer too quickly, how important is God's glory to you? How important is God's glory to you? Because to that degree, you can be bold for God. Lastly, last checkpoint, no God. No God, no Christ. Joshua knows God. He knows God has delivered him and can deliver him. He knows God was there to help him, the challenges he faces. Joshua has won battles before, and he knows God can take him through this battle right here. He knows God. If you don't have a relation with God, you don't know God. Don't be throwing up these prayers and just going, okay, God, make this happen. Do you know God? Joshua knew he served a big God, and he wasn't afraid to ask of something big. But do you see it here? He does what he's capable of doing, trusting that God will do his part. And when we know God, we can face the challenges in life, whatever they are. We can face the battles with confidence. See, boldness means we do what we're capable of doing, trusting Him with the impossible. We're not responsible for the miracles. We're responsible for doing what we are capable of doing. What impossible? What impossible are you facing right now? Can you give them that big issue? You see, the God we can trust with the running of the universe and all creation is the God we can trust in the running of our lives. I mean, is your case, your situation, any more complex or difficult than the management of the universe? See, whatever the battle you may be facing right now, remember, nothing is too big, too great for God. Now, Pastor Tony Evans was in Columbia, South Carolina, and he was preaching at this huge outreach outreach event that was being held in the University of South Carolina football stadium was outside. Thousands had gathered for the evening session, but news reports indicated a serious thunderstorm was on the way. Now, a serious thunderstorm down in Columbia, South Carolina is a serious thunderstorm. I mean, it's pretty major. Now, the storm was expected to hit at 7 p.m., the exact time the meeting was scheduled to start. So as the sky grew darker and darker, the threat of cancellation was a valid possibility. But a group of preachers and other church leaders, you know, decided they should gather for prayer. And Evans noted, and this is his story, I'm just relaying it to you, Evans noted that all the preachers prayed that many would consider safe prayers, ones that really don't ask too much of God. Then, There was this one woman named Linda, and she spoke up and said, do you mind if I pray? And and so they said, all right, go ahead. And so Linda's prayer went something like this, according to Evans. He said, Lord, she prayed, thousands have gathered to hear the good news about your son, Jesus Christ. It would be a shame on your name for us to have all these unbelievers go without the gospel when you control the weather and you can stop it. The name of Christ addressed the storm. So ended the prayer meeting. Everyone took their places under the dark, threatening sky, and the leader of the event told the people who were gathered there, you know, we're going to go as long as we can. And umbrellas sprouted up among the crowd. There was a man sitting right next to Linda, and he opened up his umbrella, and he offered to shield her as well, and Linda refused. She said, I, she said, I won't be needing any umbrella. <laughs> and Evan says, he says, he and his wife watched as the rain clouds came up to the stadium and then split in two. The storm, he said, rained on both sides of the stadium, came back together on the other side. And all those gathered for the event stayed dry. Evans asked, what did Linda have that the preachers didn't? He says, Linda had the boldness, the shameless audacity to ask. 
Now, I don't know where to put that. I'll be honest. The skeptic in me wants to go, nah, it didn't happen. I need to be careful there. I need to walk softly. Because I think it reflects how big I think God is. See, what might happen, what might happen when you dare to ask God for the impossible? What just might happen when you dare to ask God for the impossible? Now, typically, we like to respond to a message with song, very appropriate. I want us to respond in quietness and in silent prayer because I want to invite you to respond by asking God to stir your heart for boldness. I need it in my life. I need to ask God. It's a supernatural work that needs to happen in here. Yeah, I need to do things, but he needs to do it. He needs to stir our hearts to boldness, not craziness, but boldness. So let's just silently just ask God for boldness. And then I want to take it one more step. I want to challenge you and urge you and encourage you, maybe just this next week, pray for each other for boldness. Pray that there's a work that goes on in our hearts at EBC for boldness, boldness and obedience. Boldness in asking big things from a big God. Why? So that his glory is displayed. So whatever the impossible is, we just ask God for boldness for yourself. And think about the challenge that I'm giving to you about asking and praying for others to also, throughout EBC, to have boldness. Let's respond in silence as we conclude.